This episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Whether it's espresso machines, manual brewing devices, or general coffee shop needs, they seek to pursue the most innovative coffee products, both domestic and abroad, to offer their customers. Find out more at prima-coffee.com. This is Keys to the Shop, episode 30, matching your service to your quality with Casey Undercoffler. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop. I'm excited to have you with us here today. My name is Christy Furio. I'm the host of the show, and this podcast is dedicated to giving you insights, inspiration, and the tools that you're going to need to grow as a coffee service professional. And that word professional is something that we all use to describe ourselves who have worked in coffee for any length of time. And the degree to which we are able to be professional is largely determined on how much we're able to learn and grow in our positions. It could be said that you're not a professional simply because you do something as a job, but the professional is somebody who is constantly learning on the job, and in our case, in the service industry, somebody who's increasing their aptitude for how to care for guests and the experience that people have with the coffee and the items that we serve in our various uh, service environments. And today we're going to be talking about the detail work that goes into creating a great space, creating a great experience, and being a better professional. And today's guest, Casey Undercoffler, is going to help us break down the details of what we can do, practically do, in our cafes to help us elevate our service to match the quality of what we're serving. And also, we're going to talk about laying the foundation for professionalism. What kind of mindset do we have to have in order to practice these things and have them really take root in our cafes and personally as a professional. So let me tell you who Casey Undercoffler is. He is the assistant general manager at the James Beard award-winning The Bachelor Farmer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Casey has been working in the service industry for the past 11 years, and that means he's been working in restaurants, kitchens, bars, and uh, now at The Bachelor Farmer Cafe. Now, I first heard about Casey when I read a fantastic Barista Magazine article that he wrote called All the Little Things in the April-May issue of Barista Magazine, which we'll be linking to in the show notes here. But in that, he talked about the details that go into service. And uh, if you know me and you know my philosophy on on service and uh, cafes, you'll know that I'm a big fan of of things like uh, polishing and detail work in the cafe and making sure things are just right. And uh, of, course, of course, all of those things make a big difference in the cafe, and it makes a big difference in how we are perceived by the consumer, which I would argue uh, makes a big difference in terms of how successful we are convincing the consumer to take coffee seriously and to take good coffee seriously in particular. So I'm excited to bring you our conversation. Uh, Casey and I had a good talk, and I know you're going to feel more equipped after listening to this. So here now is my conversation with Casey Undercoffler. So Casey Undercoffler, Assistant General Manager at the Bachelor Farmer Cafe in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. Thank you very much, Chris. My pleasure to be here. All right. Well, I'm I'm excited because, uh, you know, I... First was made aware of uh, not only your cafe, um, but, you know, just uh, of you and your career and and what you've done in coffee and in restaurants from an article that you wrote for Barista Magazine, uh, the April May issue this year titled uh, Every Little Thing, all about like the little stuff that makes professional service really tick and and go. And I really loved your thoughts on that. I I just really wanted to get you on the show. And and here you are to talk about the little things on Keys to the Shop. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a super fun opportunity to be able to write that article. Um, Everything just sort of fell into place um, really nicely. And, you know, service is something that I'm super passionate about. And I think that it's something that uh, we as a coffee community can sort of 
definitely step up our game and make it sort of match the level of product that we're that we're pumping out every day. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll link to this article in the show notes as well. So you've been in the business of cafe and restaurant work for 11 years, and you've seen quite a bit, done quite a bit. Um, how did you get into this line of work and, and into coffee? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I sort of first got a taste of what it was to work in service through uh, some dinner parties that my dad would throw when I was like a really little kid. Um, and my favorite part was always, you know, bringing the food out to the table and like clearing the table and making a show of all of that stuff. Um, so that's sort of like where I got a first taste of it. And then I've got a couple of brothers and a sister and they've all sort of worked in and around hospitality a little bit. Um, and my oldest brother uh, found a coffee shop next to the bar that he was working at called Copland's Coffee. It was actually one of the first um, sort of third wave uh, shops that opened here in the Twin Cities about oh, yeah. uh, probably 11 years ago now. Oh, yeah. I used to love going there whenever I was the, around the Twin Cities. Yeah. So uh, I got to know the baristas there. I got to know the owner there. Um, he's, he likes to joke that uh, he sort of, you know, has known me since I was a little kid. And um, <laughs> it's always it's always fun to run into him. When I when I pop back into the shop, um, but so I, I worked I worked around coffee for a little while and like would frequent the sort of higher end coffee shops in the city. I would always had a, a passion for coffee, um, and then a few well probably five years ago now six years ago um, I got a job at Copland's actually, um, and it just sort of has spiraled uh, spiraled, spiraled from there. Uh, I worked in um, a high end cocktail bar for a little while. That's also owned by the same company that uh, I still work for, um, the bachelor farmer. Um, and they knew my background in coffee. They appreciated Copland's for, um, what it brought to the city. And, uh, they asked me to do some consulting work and then ultimately offered, ultimately offered me a position in the cafe. And so what position did you, you just started as a barista? Uh, I started at, as head barista. I got I got to consult on the build out. I got to um, recommend all the equipment that they brought in. I got to find the uh, find the first roaster that we brought in, Heart Roasters, out of Portland. Um, it was a really a really cool opportunity that they that they sort of let me let, let me run with. Nice. And and so the uh, shop is a multi roaster shop still. It is. Yep. Um, right now we're offering Olympia. Uh, uh, Olympia Coffee Roasters, um, and we'll be coming up to a switch pretty soon here, and leaving that in the capable hands of our head, our current head barista, uh, Leah Moom. Nice. Yeah. Cool. So, how what is it like being the assistant general manager? Uh, it's a lot of detail work. It's a lot of uh, a lot of pay atten- paying attention to you know every little interaction with with guests. A lot of um, putting out some you know smaller fires as far as you know invoices or. Um, any sort of guest complaints we might we might run into, but uh, for the most part, it's just you know managing day to day service and making sure that uh, every guest gets the best experience that they can. Awesome. So the cafe where you work is sort of an amalgamation of of restaurant and uh, and coffee bar. Uh, it yeah. seems like a lot like the Australian style of of service. It is, yeah. Um, it's it's not. We're not going out to tables um, to take orders. Uh, we will, you know, run a coffee every once in a while if if a guest is, you know, engaged in a conversation or something. Um, but it's definitely co- a counter service model. But we're sort of looking looking into a broader offering than the traditional cafe here in the states. So, being the um, cafe arm or or wing of the Bachelor Farmer Restaurant, I imagine the influence of the restaurant culture plays a big role in the expectations. Uh, given to you by your bosses and and what people expect when they walk in under that name? It certainly does. Um, The Bachelor Farmer is known for having very high-end service um, without being sort of that cloying, claustrophobic, um, overbearing stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we've we've worked really hard to develop that same sort of a culture in the cafe. Um, We've had lots of input from the restaurant senior management and we, I think we've, I think we've got a really, a really nice thing going. We've got a lot of, a lot of happy guests, a lot of happy employees, and we get people coming back saying that they come back for, for the service. So, what is the difference? I and mean, you've been so closely working with a bachelor farmer, and you've worked in simply, you know, a, a straightforward coffee bar at Copland's. 
What mm-hmm. is the difference that you see between something that's closely restaurant related and something that's purely coffee shop? I think that the biggest difference I've seen is um, demeanor and attitude of employees. Um, when you're in a restaurant, uh, you're able to sort of touch and go from tables. You're, you're expected to not always be visible. Um, you're expected to be there when you're needed and sort of gone when you're not. Uh, but in a cafe, you're always present. You're always in front of the guest in some way or another. There's no uh, kitchen that you can really run into and you know grab stuff from or like take a second and breathe. You're always in front of the guest. You're always um, you're all, you're always in view. Yeah, the combination of of restaurant and coffee bar thing. I, I worked as a as a head barista a while ago at a place called Carriage House Cafe in Ithaca, New York, where it was a okay. coffee bar right in front of the guests. The same way. So it's kind of weird being a barista in a service environment where people might be used to you not being able to be seen. So Mm -hmm. you kind of get used to having somebody sitting there the whole time. Uh, So I imagine demeanor would be huge. And in in this conversation, you know, as we are talking about uh, the episode before recording today, the overarching theme that you really wanted to get across was uh, like the whole premise of what you're trying to get across is the product is far exceeding service. And the increased price, you know, of coffee bars deems increased service. What can you explain that? Unpack that for us. Yeah, we we as an industry have have taken leaps and bounds in uh, in the quality of the product that we're putting out. And, you know, our direct relationships with farmers our you know, increased knowledge of importer practices, um, everything down to looking at the TDS of coffee. Um, we're really getting into that sort of stuff and service has sort of been static ever since, um, the quality has increased. And I think that what we really need to start focusing on is, um, paying attention to not only the product that the guest is getting, um, being a higher price point, but also the service needs to match that higher price point. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't go into, a high-end restaurant or a high-end bar and accept mediocre service at, uh, you know, for, for a $13 cocktail or a $25 entree, you know, you, 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 you expect a certain level of, um, presence, a certain level of, you know, kindness, um, a certain level of authenticity coming from the barista, um, as well as you would coming from a server or a bartender. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And it's almost as though we sometimes set up the conversation to shut down feedback. Like we don't really open ourselves up the same way that that restaurants do in a sense. Like they know that people are going to say something if something is wrong. But as a barista, I mean, you're lucky if somebody gives you constructive criticism at all. Yeah, very true. Um, Just just the other day I was in a shop and I got a coffee and it wasn't great, but I felt like I couldn't go up to the barista and you know offer some constructive feedback because there's this sense of uh, in a lot of shops that I've been to around the country that you know the barista is doing their thing for a reason and they're sort of above reproach. Hmm. Yeah, sort of uh, the expert versus the uh, the lay person, the pedestrian. Yeah, exactly. But ultimately, you never know who you're serving your coffee to, and you have to be you have to be ready to take that feedback for what it is, whether it's you know helpful or not. You should you're, it, it's part of your job to be there and listen to your guest. Sure, and it is something that judges at the USBC would always say is you can treat every customer in your cafe as a judge. Yeah. One of the reasons we're here is to sort of talk about some practical things that we can do to make amends for that kind of uh, gap between the quality of what people receive and the quality of, of how they receive it from us in the service. Yeah. So you've broken it down into three categories. There's tangible things, there's intangible things, and then there's professionalism. So I feel like starting with the tangibles is a pretty good place to start. So yeah. what are some tangible things that we can do to kind of level up our service for the guest? I think some of the some of the most important things um, in my mind and the things that I really try and instill uh, in the staff at our cafe is uh, polishing, a clean workstation, 
and presentation of your beverage, food, whatever it may be. Um, <clears throat> and sort of a, let's just start at the beginning, polishing. It's, a, it's, it's an annoyance, to be sure. Uh, it's sort of always there, always in the background. Um, but it's a super important detail that sort of makes the whole shop come together, makes the whole shop sparkle. Um, a lot of these, these sort of tangible things um, that I think about are, I, I think about in terms of, you know, what would I be looking for uh, when I go into any other cafe um, or restaurant for that matter, you know, if I sit down and I get a water glass that's all spotty or has some residue from the dishwasher or the triple sink, you know, that's not that's not a, a good experience for me. That that makes me think of, you know, okay, who else has used this glass? What what am I sort of getting <laughs> into? So pol- polishing polishing is a big thing, even though it's you know a little bit annoying. Um, it also just sort of makes that makes that that gleam a little bit better. Um, and uh, coffee shops, cafes are full of a lot of chrome, shiny things. You know, espresso machines are often primarily chrome or brass or whatever. You know, things, yeah. things, are, things are trending a little bit more matte, but there's still those. Uh, so those, annoying. You're right. Yeah. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a super simple little fix of... Um, taking that extra second, taking that extra 15 seconds and, uh, whether it's just drying off your porcelain cups or doing a full on polish of your glassware, um, it's something that someone's going to notice and someone's going to appreciate. You know, there's, there's, uh, uh, a lot of times that I'll walk into a space and I'll look around and something just doesn't seem quite right. Um, it seems like all, all the light is a little bit lower. Um, like nothing is quite shining as bright as it should. And sure enough, nothing is shining as bright as it should because it hasn't been polished. Right. That's why the light's lower. Why fix it so that people see the, the glassware that's not polished? We just hide it by ha- not yeah. having good light. Yeah. The polishing of glassware, polishing of, of silver and cups and, and keeping everything shiny. I mean, big problems that baristas think about and managers and anyone working in a cafe is, you know, getting through the line, um, getting their side work done. And oftentimes as a manager, you can add side work that it says, you know, like polish stuff, um, but not necessarily, it doesn't have a lot of um, urgency behind it. So it sounds like you're, you're kind of asking people to trust that this will make a difference in the long run, but don't expect maybe that it's going to like change people's minds about your cafe immediately. Yeah. So, um, the thing, the thing that comes to mind is, uh, there was an article written a while ago about, uh, Pete Wells, the New York times food critic. Um, and it was talking about, he comes into, uh, restaurants and, uh, he doesn't announce himself, you know, he sort of tries to, tries to hide the fact that he is the New York Times food critic. Um, he'll put his uh, reservation into different names and whatnot, uh, but he's expecting that the manager of the restaurant will recognize him and know that he's uh, Pete Wells, because the whole, the whole idea is if they're not able to recognize that small detail of this is the, the food critic that's coming in, if they're not able to see that small detail, then what big details have they missing? You know, what 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 dishes are they sending out that are incorrect? It's it's you know you start you you work small and you miss small. Um, that's sort of that sort of a mentality. Oh, I love that saying. And you can dial yourself into the details pretty well. I always surprised at how much we are able to accomplish uh, mentally when we absolutely have to. So. Uh, polishing and cleaning is is one of those things, and keeping a clean workstation is even harder. Uh, I mean, how do you maintain a clean workstation when you're just getting crushed? Yeah, um, I mean, with with a product like coffee, you're naturally going to have some mess about your workstation, um, and it's less it's less about making sure making sure that you're staying clean after every beverage, but it's more about making sure that you're staying clean as a whole, you know, in, in that lull after you finish your 15 drinks in a row, take a second and wipe everything down, refold your towels, put all your stuff away and make sure that you're set up for success when the next rush happens. You know, it's, uh, I was listening to one of your earlier episodes where you're talking about, uh, workflow and it sort of all ties into that. You know, it's, it's easier to, um, reset yourself and know where everything is rather than, leave a messy station 
and find yourself caught off guard when the next rush does happen and you're looking around for your chocolate or you're looking around for uh, your milk or whatever you whatever you may you may need. It takes a fair bit of patience to do that. It sure does. Yes, it's it's definitely it's definitely a practice that you have to um, be conscious about. You've got to really really be aware of the appropriate times to do those things. And uh, you know, sometimes sometimes you can't quite get to everything, and that's okay. I'm not saying that everybody's perfect or that everybody should be perfect, but it's about striving towards uh, these these steps in order to make yourself the best employee that you can be. Sure. And if you work a full-time job, you've got 40 hours a week to try to just nudge yourself forward a little bit at a time. It's a lot of practice. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's good. No one ever said that this was easy. That's true. Somebody might have, but, uh, they found out <laughs> wrong somewhere along the line. I hope, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the presentation I find interesting. There's is something that really uh, excites me is the idea of, um, you know, how we present something to the customer is, is not necessary. These little touches are not necessary, but they really can make a customer's day, especially when they notice it. Or maybe even if they don't notice it, it's just like, you know, you did it and it creates yeah. this consistent experience of, of excellence. What are some of those things that we can do? Uh, so some, some of the things are as simple as making sure that your latte art is facing towards the guest when they come up to get their beverage, you know, like just mm-hmm. turn it so it's faced towards them, just like if they if they were a judge at a latte art throwdown, you know, like it. That's that's a, a pretty part of this this industry. Like we're able to do these beautiful images, um, and it's a skill that you know the average guest doesn't have, and it's fun for them to come and like sort of say, "Oh, it's too pretty to drink." Um, <laughs> So like hi- highlight that sort of things. And then, you know, if you're, if you're serving just a, a regular mug of coffee, take that extra second and turn the handle towards the guests so that they don't have to, you know, reach around and spin it for themselves or try and pick it up by the hot outside of the cup. You know, give give them give them this little this little gesture of I know that this is a thing uh, that could potentially be too hot for your hand. But here's here's my here's my gesture of use this handle and it won't be too hot or. Um, I'm paying attention to the fact that you are actually coming up to me and taking this thing, um, sort of recognizing that you're producing a product for your guest. And you're kind of putting yourself in their shoes. This comes back to empathy where you say this could happen. And so I, as the uh, professional, I, as the barista, I am going to make sure that that as much as I can help it doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's important to think about what is night what like like again it sort of goes back to the the um thing i was talking about earlier where put yourself in the shoes of the guest and imagine what would make you feel comfortable what would, what would make you feel uh happy and like you were like you were being recognized as someone who had uh just spent money on a product all right before we continue here with casey talking about the details that go into creating better service for our customers and matching our service to our quality, I wanted to talk to you about our sponsor, Prima Coffee. Prima is a specialty coffee equipment supplier that's based out of here in Louisville, Kentucky. And from their inception, they've set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public and their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need, from grinders to espresso machines to undercounter fridges. And they put a big emphasis also on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. And I've known these guys for a long time. I vouch for them. I use them in the stores, always had great service. And right now, when you visit their website, prima-coffee.com, you can use the promo code keys. 10. That's K-E-Y-S in the number 10. And that is going to give you $10 off any purchase over $75. Some restrictions do apply. So you go to the website prima-coffee.com. And when you check out, you can use the promo code that's only for keys to the shop listeners, keys 10. And that will give you the discount. And thank you Prima for your generosity and for supporting keys to the shop and our industry by equipping us with really great tools to do our jobs well. So now let's get back to our conversation with Casey Underkoffler and some practical ways that we can raise our service to the level of our quality. So tangibles of polishing, keeping things clean at your workstation, 
and the presentation of how you how you give the coffee to the customer, how you present yourself to the customer because you you are on display for them. Uh, there's got to be a psychology to this, like the customer coming in doesn't nitpick every single thing, but they take the whole image in with them. And I feel like they mostly judge the experience after they've walked away and they can only remember a few things. And you know, I imagine these are the things that really helped push them over the edge to let them remember it in a nice way. Yeah, we've 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 only got a few minutes uh, of actual service when guests come to come into a cafe and you've really got to make sure that those times shine through everything that's around you not only uh, the way that you interact with a guest but making sure that you know the place looks like a somewhere that you would want to come back to that you you feel comfortable coming back to so those are some of the tangible things and of course we could probably fill an entire episode full of tangible things but the lesson here is kind of pay attention to what's around you, like you said, and and organize it and give it purpose and it creates more welcome. Now there's some intangibles too. So we started with tangibles and now there's intangible things. Um, What are, what would you define as intangible and and practically speaking, how can we affect that in a positive way? Yeah. Um, So two, two of the sort of biggest intangibles for me are demeanor and environment. Um, So demeanor, you know, is going to be specifically talking about the baristas and the whole and the team as a whole um, and how they conduct themselves in the space and then environment is looking at the things um like ambiance like what music is playing um like the level of conversation that is sort of in the entire space um that's that sort of stuff the, the things that are always present but you might not have uh, actual interaction with Okay, so demeanor, uh, we'll start with that and, and kind of dive into it a little bit more. So my thought on this is that we have this ability to forget that we're in public when we're behind the bar. Yeah. And yeah. There, that can lead to some interesting circumstances where you kind of uh, aren't aware of customers and you say or do things that maybe aren't the best things. Uh, what, have you experienced that? Like, what what are some examples of where people have done it right and where people have done it wrong. Um, so some of the examples of where people have done it right, uh, every, every day in the, in the bachelor farmer cafe, when I walk in, um, you know, if there's a guest standing on the other side of the espresso machine, um, our baristas aren't staring at the ground. They're not talking with each other. They're engaging with the guests and they're making sure that, you know, they're not waiting to have a question answered. They're, they're, um, they're being addressed. They're they're getting they're getting their the full attention of the staff member because that's what that's what they're part of the experience that they're paying for is. Um, sometimes that I've experienced sort of the other end um, around town and around the country is you know you'll you'll walk into uh, a cafe or a restaurant even and it takes you know a beat two beats three beats for somebody to greet you and somebody to um, acknowledge that maybe you don't know what's going on or maybe you have a question and you're looking around and um, people are avoiding your, 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 your gaze because they don't want, they don't want to be um, inconvenienced by the fact that uh, they're at work and you're a guest at their, at their work. <laughs> strange. That's very strange. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a strange experience when, some, when you can tell someone is trying to ignore you um, because they don't want to be inconvenienced by you. I will confess to you, as a new barista, I've totally been there. And one of the reasons why I did it, you know, feeling had that feeling was because I really loved coffee and I was not really there for the guest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I, I was there to get something out of it and not give something to people through it. And, yeah. and, and so I bet you there's people listening to this, even though they might not admit it uh, right now, that are in the same boat. Maybe there's a, a lot of expectation that baristas have or staff have. I'm going into work and it's going to be fun because I'm going to get something out of it. Yeah. And I, I, I've, I've been in that same spot, too, where, you know, you know you're, you're interested in, in, the, in gaining knowledge rather than providing service. And that was that was the first, you know few years of me working in service, um, I was interested in how I could, you know, spend my time 
becoming better friends with my coworkers or um, developing relationships with regular customers, but not sort of the one-offs who would come in every once in a while. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it's, it takes a lot of sort of uh, conscious effort to change your attitude about that sort of thing. Like you have to, you have to be able to acknowledge that you can still learn while giving great service to all, all of your guests. You don't have to give up knowing your coworkers either, I would say. Right, exactly. Um, there's, there's nothing that says that you can't have a, have a personal conversation with your coworkers, but you just have to know when to check that. And you have to all have this understanding that in the middle of a sentence, one of you might walk away in order to go and help a guest. Uh, and that's I love okay. That. I love doing that. Yeah. <laughs> just like, to demonstrate and see if they're just cool with it or, yeah. you know, you, you've, you've got to, you've got to, when you're in a management position, you've got to lead by example. And if you're not willing to break off that personal conversation in, in order to go and assist a guest, then how can you expect somebody else to be willing to do that? Personal conversations is a, is a big thing, I think, because, you know, sometimes I, I, sometimes I wonder if people have headphones in because they either a don't like the music or B don't want to hear the barista's conversation. Yeah, that's that's a very it's a very good point, um, and I think that a lot of that comes down to uh, just being mindful of the volume of your conversation, whether it's about work or not. You know, no one on the other side of the counter wants to hear you talking about uh, the TDS of your coffee uh, or you know what your input and output for the espresso is when you're doing a bar change. Um, the guests don't really want to hear that unless they come up and ask you about it. And it's a, it's, it's a two way street, you know, um, you don't want to insert yourself into any of their conversations just as much as they don't want to overhear your conversation. Exactly. And, and that's the opt in moment that you have to be aware of for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you you, one of the things you say is that you don't have to be working all the time, but you shouldn't really look bored. Right. You know, there's, there's the, there's the old adage of if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. And while there's, while there's a little bit of truth to that, I, I can't expect anybody to be constantly working and constantly cleaning because that's not what I'm able to do. You know, I'm, I'm a person just like everybody else. And, you know, it's nice to take a second and catch up with your coworkers, but you should not just be standing there, you know, leaning against the counter um, waiting for the opportunity to check your phone or like <laughs> looking around and deep sighing because there's no, no drinks up and no guests at the counter, you know, <laughs> there's still, there's, there's always guests in the space. And also it's, uh, it's funny when you see somebody kind of stretch their back out on the, the counter and say, Oh, it's so slow. Yeah. It, it's, it's just, it's just inappropriate to the rest of the guests because they deserve uh, as much respect as any guest who's at the counter, you know, but when, as long as the guest is in your space, um, they're, they're paying for that time, you know, whether they got a cup of coffee and are sitting there for, you know, a few hours working on a paper or a big business presentation, or if they, you know, have gotten six cup of coffee, six cups of coffee, and they've been there for 20 minutes, you know, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. They're, they're all paying customers and, uh, every guest deserves, uh, deserves our attention and our respect. And it brings us to our next point here. So after we've talked about these uh, tangible things and then the intangibles of our demeanor and the environment and and really dialing those things in for the guest's benefit and and being aware of those details, uh, there's another layer to all this. And it kind of feeds, it's the undergirding foundation and that's professionalism. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so talk to us a little bit about what professionalism is and, and how it really informs all of this. I think for a while uh, in the coffee industry, we've sort of been referring to ourselves as coffee professionals, but we haven't really taken up the mantle of what that means. Um, it's not just saying that you're a professional. It's more about how you conduct yourself uh, in the world around us, you know, in, whether it's in the coffee industry or whether it's just out at a restaurant, you know, it's, it's about being aware of you as a persona rather than just you as, uh, as a barista who thinks that they're 
particularly good at making pour overs or pouring lattes. So just because you do it as a job does not make, <clears throat> make you a professional necessarily. Professional is is what you're saying is it's earned through training yourself to serve. Yeah, absolutely. And you always have to be ready to serve because there's no reason that a guest should have to wait for you to get into the mindset of uh, the professional, the, the hospitality professional who um, should be ready to serve. And you know you you have a shift coming up the next day or or you wake up and you know you, you're going to be going into work. You have time to get yourself in the mindset, um, not necessarily just rolling into it and hoping that the right mindset shows up. You can create that mindset on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I think we, I think we need to work at creating that mindset and it's going to be different for everybody as far as how you prepare yourself for it. You know, for, for me, it's, um, when I wake up, I put on a nice pair of clothes and that makes me feel like I'm, uh, ready to sort of lead this team that we have and, set good examples and do and sort of present myself to uh, the guests and the rest of the team as someone who can be confident and can be a leader uh, when the time when the time comes and you know also that means knowing when to step back and let the rest of the team lead themselves right so getting yourself into the mindset of of service also what helps is the mindset of knowing that you're in a culture that holds each other accountable for a common standard. And as, as, an, as, as an assistant manager or assistant GM right now, I imagine that broadcasting the message is even more important in your position. Yeah, absolutely. A lot, a lot of what sort of the Bachelor Farmer uh, team is built on is uh, if it needs to be done, it's your job to do it and uh, lead by example. So those two sort of tie in together in this, in this sort of a professional uh in this, in this discussion of professionalism, uh, because if, if you're not if you're not willing to do something as a uh, manager, assistant general manager, general manager, there's there's really no way that you can ask somebody who is in a position lower than you to do that for you. You know, it, it's not that you always have to be doing it yourself, but it's that you always have to be willing to do it yourself if someone else you know is busy in service or whatever it may be. The number of times that I've had to unclog toilets because a guest has come in and all of the other employees are busy is more than I care to remember. <laughs> Do you feel comfortable? Like, Does your team and your baristas feel comfortable holding each other accountable um, even though they're peers? Absolutely. Um, th we have had... Uh, uh, pretty pretty much every day somebody somebody checks another employee and is like hey have you stocked this hey why aren't you doing this a certain way um you know our 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 head barista Leah Moom she comes in and she uh tastes all the shots that the barista on duty has you know just to make sure that um uh, those are all up to spec um you know, we're, we're all constantly working to keep each, keep each other and ourselves in check and keep each other, um, at this level of professional service that, uh, we have sort of decided that we want to lead the charge on as far as, uh, service in this city. Uh, we, we want to, we want to make sure that, uh, every guest gets, gets the best experience that they can and that we're able to provide that to them consistently. It seems like some of the culture of coffee bars in general, and this is such a wide sweeping uh, judgment, so get ready, uh, <laughs> is that we don't want to talk about work at work. This is, you know, in our conversation on this uh, previous episode with Bruce Tolgan, the author of It's Okay to Be the Boss, mm -hmm. he talks about how talking about work at work is such a rare thing. And, you know, you see it at coffee bars a lot where we don't talk about what we're doing. We talk about what we're going to do when we're not there or, yeah. you know, scroll through Pandora or Spotify or, you know, whatever it is. So for a lot of us, it's it's not as easy as saying, like, now we're going to start keeping each other accountable. But it, it sounds like it, it, it needs to happen, but it's going to be hard going at first if we're not already doing it. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um 
it it was a it was a struggle when we first opened um, about a year and a half ago because we had a team coming from all different uh, shops around the city and all different industries around the city, um, and to get them to sort of come together and work through this uh, sort of different style and into a more professional level of service, you know, it, it, it takes time. We we were lucky enough to be able to train for a full month before we opened. Um, in order to really get everything dialed in, both literally and metaphorically, um, and sort of develop the develop all these systems. And now, whenever we get a new employee in, they're uh, sort of it, it's e- it's easier for us to uh, integrate them into our existing service culture um, because we did have that opportunity at the beginning to really sort of set our goals and set our sights on what we wanted to accomplish through service, not just through coffee. Now, I imagine that because you are holding each other accountable for the work that you do on a daily basis, um, essentially giving each other feedback, it makes it easier to kind of receive feedback from guests. And maybe does it make guests feel like they can give more feedback too? I like to think so. Um, it's always, it's always hard, uh, knowing, what feedback from guests you're getting and what feedback from guests you're not getting. Um, there, there are enough, there are enough times where I'll see a, uh, mostly full beverage in our bus tubs, um, that I think, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't tasting quite right, or maybe it's not quite what they expected, but you can only, only guess so much at that. Um, we do get, we do get a good amount of feedback from our guests when, you know, something, uh, doesn't taste right to them or when something uh, is really good. Uh, I've, I've heard from several of the employees at, at the Bachelor Farmer that, um, you know, when, they come, when they'll come in to work, they'll stop in the Bachelor Farmer Cafe before they head in. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of, sort of a, a way for them to lift their mood before they have to go into work because the people in the cafe are always so positive and so, uh, so happy to be there and so happy to happy to be ready to serve. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So now when you go into a cafe, you were mentioning earlier that you don't feel comfortable giving feedback to baristas. And I I admit the same thing. Some of the reason why is because I don't even know if they can do anything about it or if they've been empowered to actually deliver that message to somebody who can make a a difference. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's true. I think, uh, one of, one of the sort of bigger issues that we have as an industry is that uh, a lot of times in a cafe you're not sure how much power you do have uh, because oftentimes our margins are so slim uh, that you're not really sure if you can throw away a fully fully made beverage and then remake it and I, that that seemed that seems like a like an issue of you know communication from ownership or senior management of various cafes and making sure that we're actually willing to put guests before profit because at the end of the day uh it's about it's about guest service and profit will come if you give good service you know we we as uh, the bachelor farmer restaurant um were not profitable for the first two and a half years of being open Mm -hmm. because we were just setting our sights on giving great service and great product and everything else sort of fell into place behind it Right. So you had a high standard and it, it meant some waste, but yeah. in the end you got it back. Exactly. And I think that coffee shops in, in general, cafes in general are a little bit too scared of waste, mm. um, in some positions and too accepting of it in others. You know, I, I, in my opinion, I don't think that someone needs 45 minutes to dial in their espresso at the beginning of the day. <laughs> Um, it doesn't, it, it, cha- it changes a lot, but it doesn't change that much. And at the end of the day, it really is just coffee. Sure. Um, and I think that to, to sort of, sort of check our, our mentality of coffee being this, uh, really superior beverage and that it takes a long time to find that perfect shot. We need to, uh, we need to just start serving it. So one of the things that we deal with in the service industry, and it's not necessarily the, uh, 800 pound gorilla elephant or whatever animal you want to use in the room, because we're, we're talking about it so much these days. And we had an episode where, you know, it was just me. It was a uh, episode 19 of 10 reasons to love the customer. 
mm-hmm. because these articles about how we hate customers as service employees are so uh, numerous, it's it's almost it's almost funny if it yes. wasn't so sad. Right. But the reality is, is that sometimes, and I would say maybe for other people, a lot of the times, customers can be very, very difficult. Um, and it creates in us as people that are fallible. We're not as strong on Wednesday as we were on Monday. Um, you say that annoyance is for after work and that we all have difficult guests. And I wonder how how do you navigate the emotional kind of the emotional heavy lifting that has to happen when you deal with people that give unjustified um, negativity in a service environment. Yeah. Um, to, be, to be totally frank, sometimes I don't deal with it in the best ways. And sometimes <laughs> I, I, I do talk about um, an annoying guest at work. And I, I realize uh, in the moment that I'm doing something inappropriate and that I'm not being a good leader uh, through this. But you know, I, as, as a person... Sometimes you just can't quite keep it all in. It's about being aware of those moments and uh, being able to sort of take that as a learning experience and say, okay, next time I'm not going to do this uh, because it's inappropriate. I, th- I think the, 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 big, the best way that I've learned to deal with um, difficult guests is that you can always see it from their side. You always have to be able to try and see it from their side. Um, sometimes it, it's the hardest thing in the world to see why, uh, they won't accept the solution that you're offering and that they want the solution that they've decided is appropriate. Sometimes that's the hardest thing in the world. And sometimes, um, their complaint might seem like the most ridiculous thing possible to you. Um, one, one example is once I had a guest, uh, who wanted their chocolate croissant warmed up and that's not something that we offer in our cafe. Um, they took a bite and then they came back and said that it was inedible. Um, and that was a really hard thing for me to hear. But the way that you deal with it is you, you know, give them a smile and you say, okay, I'm sorry about that. Just immediately take, take responsibility for whatever it may be. Um, because there's no reason to give them an excuse. You should just apologize and make it right. Mm -hmm. Um, so you end up, you know, maybe giving, giving them their money back, maybe giving them, um, a different item, uh, or maybe it's something as simple as, you know, you can't fix the problem for them and that they leave, uh, unhappy. That's sort of a worst case scenario, but it's about coming at them with so much kindness and so much, um, acceptance of their complaint. Uh, it's tricky, but it's, it's doable. A lot of people, I think, and, and myself included, sometimes wonder what the line is when it's when it comes to something like that. And you know, you were talking about something benign, the, the chocolate croissant, and it's annoying. I, I think one of the things that could be said is that as professionals, uh, what's the line between you know acquiescing to a guest's complaint and then the line where the guest starts to become uh, just rude and it's not tolerable. So for for me for me the line there is when it starts becoming personal. Um, a, a guest never has the right to personally attack an employee. Uh, that's sort of the line where uh, you you are, are able to sort of turn off the the um, customer is always right sort of mentality. Right. right. Uh, you know, if if somebody if somebody wants to complain about a beverage or a food product or whatever. I'm more than happy to fix it for them. If they start saying that this beverage isn't good because this person made it, then it's <laughs> then it's getting a little bit into the gray territory of okay, maybe there's some history here that I don't really understand or know, but it's inappropriate for this environment. And then then you have to you know sort of bump it up to uh, your manager, or in my case, you've got to bump it to me, and then I've got to figure out <laughs> what to do about it. Yeah, you got to defend your staff at some point. Yeah, but a, a, a lot of a lot of the time, thankfully, we we don't run into that. I think in the in the service industry, and a lot of a lot of the th- the times that we do run into that, um, it's because you know people on both sides aren't conducting themselves professionally. You know, it's it's the guest not knowing what their role as a guest ought to be, and the 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 worker not knowing what their role as the professional service employee ought to be. Now that along with all the other things in professionalism takes a lot of patience in practice. Yes. 
And you are, after 11 years of being in coffee, not, I would imagine, uh, the same person you were when you started. Most certainly not. No, I have, I have grown and developed, uh, a lot in these last, uh, three and a half years at the bachelor farmer because our, um, our managing director, Nathan Restance, who sort of oversees, uh, all of the service and all of the, all of the, um, hospitality aspects, uh, came up with a really wonderful training handbook, um, that has, uh, enlightened me throughout my years. And I've, I've read it over and over and over, um, and every time I come away with something new and something something uh, better that I can focus on, uh, we, we've got this list of rules um, called Service 101. Uh, and the one that is constantly called out uh, by everybody on staff is rule number 37, and that's slow down, uh, yeah. which is which is so, so important. You know, at a certain point you can only work so fast. And once you start breaking things, once you start mismaking beverages, once you start mismaking food, that's when you really need to remember to slow down. Um, it's not, it's not about physically slowing down. It's about mentally slowing down. It's about checking yourself. It's about being, being at your best to do your best every day. Absolutely. That's, that's a great rule. Rule 37. Sounds Rule like 37. the signal to noise ratio is getting out of whack and there's a lot more noise. <laughs> um, so in all of these things, you know, being uh, a professional, looking at the tangible things that we can do that we discussed and the intangibles and sort of having this learner's mentality where, you know, you're going to be a different person and who you are is, is determined by little decisions that you make in these areas every day. Where do we start? Where where does one start in all of this to to make the biggest impact and, and set the right trajectory? I think the place that everybody can start is by looking at themselves as the guest and looking at what they want out of an experience when they walk into a coffee shop, a bar, a restaurant, and then be able to reflect that and give that to each and every guest that comes in. I think that's 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 the place that we all need to start. We all need to start by putting ourselves uh, in the shoes of the guest and realizing that everybody has different expectations, everybody has different desires, but at the end of the day, if you think about yourself as the guest, just do what would make you feel comfortable. Well, Casey, this has been an amazing talk. I, I really love the subject that we're talking about, and um, I think you've done so much to enlighten us and give us some tools that we can use to just become better professionals. And um, I wonder how can we uh, stay in touch and, and be informed about what you all are doing over at the Bachelor Farmer Cafe? Yeah, um, best way to sort of follow along with what we're doing at the Bachelor Farmer is through Instagram, just at the Bachelor Farmer. Um, we are always posting stuff. We're always uh, coming up with new things and putting them out there. Um, that's probably the best way to to sort of follow along with with what we're what we're going through. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, that was a really great conversation with Casey. I really appreciate uh, him taking the time to share with us. So thank you once again to Casey Underkoffler. And all the things that Casey shared and we talked about in this episode are things that you can do in your cafe. Now, you're going to have to also function within the structure of communication and authority that you're in now with your manager. Uh, If you're a barista, you have to go through your manager, etc. But I would say that for most of us, there are things that we can just do that will make a big difference in the guest's experience. And it takes having the mindset of looking out for potential for improvement and looking out for potential for the guests to have a less than great time with the coffee and guarding against it by being preemptive, preemptively planning against potential uh, hiccups in service. So whether it's polishing your cups and, and drying them or arranging them in the right way, you know, being clean on your bar, presenting yourself as always ready to serve and not bored at work, addressing the guest quickly when they approach the bar, when they enter the store. All of these little things create a big picture that the guest leaves with that not many are going to be able to articulate. But again, uh, based on some of the other conversations we've had on Keys to the Shop, it's about how you make people feel. 
And a feeling is made up of a lot of detail work that those of us who are in service are responsible for creating. So we can take the tangibles of polishing and cleaning our workstation and presenting the product in an organized and purposeful way. We can take the intangibles, like how we present ourselves, our demeanor, um, care, being careful not to uh, flood the cafe with music that is distracting or or with our own personal conversations, like having the mindset that it's not necessarily about my conversations and my agenda, but it's about making your agenda to serve others. And, and that's why we're in the service industry. Um, the environment has to be conducive as well. So those are some of the intangibles. And then as professionals, you know, this is the foundation of all of those things, which we could talk about for a long time. Having a professional mindset is one of having a growth mindset. I've mentioned Dr. Carol Dweck's book many times called Mindset, which we'll link to in the show notes here as well. Uh, We give that book out to every staff member at our cafe because in service especially, I feel we need to have a growth mindset where, like Casey said, and, and is true for me too, we are not the same people that we were when we first started as baristas way back in the day. You learn from your experiences and become better and better. And um, a professional is somebody who practices with patience and develops skill over time. And what Casey shared in this episode, I feel will help us and equip us to become better professionals over time. So if you want to know more about Keys to the Shop, you can just visit keystothoshop.com. I would encourage you also to subscribe to our show and leave us a review or rating on iTunes. Always appreciate that, and it helps the show uh, in its standing on iTunes. Show notes are also available on the website, and you can reach out to me, chris at keystotheshop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keystotheshop.com. If you have any comments or want to tell me a story, uh, if you resonate with today's episode and want to share your story uh, about how detail work made your cafe better or you better as a barista or professional, I would love to hear about it. And um, I really appreciate all of you. And I, I encourage you to go this week Take a look around your cafe, see what you can change, see how you can just tweak something consistently over time. Uh, Maybe it's just something little and you grow it from there. But we all have the power to elevate our service to the level of the quality of our coffee. And it builds a stronger industry when we do that for sure. So I hope that today's episode, just like every other episode on the show, has given you keys to the shop.